last three of our reward circuitry should, in principle, allow transhumans and posthumans to be animated by gradients of bliss. But the kinds of well-being they will undergo are extremely speculative. Um, here's one scenario. I take it with a large grain of salt. Um, back in, I think it was 1998, a certain Dr. Itchak Fried was uh, operating on a girl with intractable epilepsy and stimulating parts of her left cortex near the language centers and stumbled on what one what we might call the humor center and electrically stimulated with microelectrodes particular part of the brain induced in this 16 year old epileptic a sense of uncontrollable mirth Essentially, whatever she was doing, whatever she was focusing on, whatever she was seeing, would induce a sense of profound hilarity, at least if the current was at the right voltage. Um, today, we think of ourselves, perhaps occasionally, as, or if one is lucky, quite often, as having some fun, having a good time, enjoying a laugh. But in principle, at any rate, we can use the new technology uh, to enjoy fun that is of a physiological intensity that is completely inaccessible to contemporary Darwinian life. Um, now, one's got to be quite careful here. Um, one of the worries, for example, in inducing an indiscriminate sense of mirth would be that, uh, yes, your mother could be uh, uh, wailing in distress and drowning, and presumably you would be finding this stimulus hysterically funny, which is a, a profoundly disturbing thought. But once we have engineered the nasty side of life out of existence, and I assume smart technology will allow our descendants to live in controlled environments, then yes, one will be able to have fun in a far richer, deeper and more profound sense than anything accessible today. <coughs> What should EAs be doing? Um, one of the worries of calling for a twin track approach as I do, i.e. combating both uh, poverty, factory farming, the obvious causes of extreme suffering in the world today, clearly combating absolute poverty uh, is a priority for effective altruists. Um, but at the same time, unless we actually tackle the genetic biological roots of suffering, all our efforts in some sense may come to naught. I think a lot of people when they read something like the Ipsos poll reported in The Economist a few years ago, we call this Ipsos poll, they just ask people whether you feel sad, happy or very happy and the number of people who reported themselves as very happy, completely unadjusted for anything else, just very happy, was highest for Indonesia, followed by India, followed by Mexico. And intuitively one feels, well, perhaps they were just make, making it up, that a, a, an Indonesian peasant doing backbreaking work in the fields can't really be as happy as someone need, with a first world lifestyle and standard of living. But, to some extent, at any rate, I think we need to take these reports at face value. Uh, and uh, what are the consequences of taking such reports at face value? Not that we shouldn't energetically combat absolute poverty. I think combating absolute poverty is a priority. One wouldn't talk to uh, a mother whose child was starving or malnourished or, or sick that what was really necessary was recalibrating her hedonic set point. But if we're actually going to tackle the roots of the problem, we are going to have to address the biological and genetic causes of suffering and malaise. And essentially, natural selection did not design us to be happy. Each of our core emotions fulfilled a particular role on, in, on the African savanna, and other things being equal, Discontent is adaptive, it's fitness enhancing. Spending a lot of one's life being frustrated, uh, discontented, cheesed off, constantly pursuing fresh opportunities, um, not being 
not counting one's blessings, so to speak. It's adaptive. And whether one has uh, an, in an income of, a, so, uh, of around, let's say, $1,000 a year or $100,000 a year, the chances are one is going to spend a lot of one's life malaise-ridden and discontented, and some of the time at least profoundly uh, uh, unhappy. And the only way to change this is going to be to address the biological genetic roots of, of, of suffering. I think first of all what is needed is some systematic analysis. What I'm not doing is, is rattling a, a, a tin for uh, my own particular organisation or anything like that. But I, yes, I do think there should be some extremely hard-headed analysis about what is the most cost-effective use of funds. And perhaps the intervention in humans that might make the biggest long-term impact uh, on suffering uh, would be pre-implantation genetic screening offered to all prospective parents. Extremely cost-effective. Or Already it is more widely available in India and China than it is in the UK, uh, albeit for purposes of, of gender selection. And such pre-implantation genetic screening could not only catch the obvious genetic diseases that are a tremendous burden on any economy, increasingly such pre-implantation screening will be able to catch, uh, for example, a predisposition to low mood. Now, something like mood disorders are more complicated than something like the genetics of cystic fibrosis, yet nonetheless, in narrowly economic terms, low mood is a tremendous burden on the economy. And uh, depression, for example, uh, causes at least as much impairment to quality of life as cystic fibrosis. Um, and eventually, one would hope, starting off with pre-implantation genetic screening and ultimately full-blown genetic engineering, it will be possible to ratchet up levels of default well-being. Uh, so that every child born has a very strong predisposition to both physical and psychological health. Well, one has to remember that only very recently had the first genes associated with, or rather allelic variants associated with a high or low hedonic set point been isolated. Either COMT or catecholomethyl transferase or the ADA 2B gene deletion variant, one associated with optimism, the other with pessimism, or the serotonin transporter gene. This is, this, this, this is new stuff. Um, and most parents are still not comfortable with the idea of doing anything that smacks of eugenics. Yes, uh, until recently it didn't seem likely that existing humans would be able to modify their own genetic source code, but the whole CRISPR genome editing revolution means that people alive today may, admittedly not for one or two decades, be able to actually edit their own genomes, um, which potentially an extraordinarily exciting uh, uh, development. Um, but one of, the one of the reasons right now why progress in psychopharmacology has been slow is that an entire neurotransmitter system is out of bounds. When it comes to tackling depression, uh, the opioid system intimately involved in hedonic tone. And the, the problem is that drugs that, in other, that might have been classed as antidepressants, such as mu opioids, have of course familiar problems of abuse, dose escalation, tolerance, uh, selfishness. Um, and somehow we want to improve people's native hedonic tone without the problems of existing opioid drugs, and that's a formidable challenge. One of the big advantages of, of drugs is that, that they enable far greater de degree of fine-tuning than uh, genes and gene therapy. And yet at the same time, instead of giving birth to children who are dysfunctional, troubled, 
prey to all the familiar storms and stress, emotional stresses of adolescence, wouldn't it be better if we had children who are genetically predisposed to be super happy, to be super healthy, and indeed it's possible to imagine in future uh, that the very idea of taking drugs, chemicals to change one's state of consciousness will be repugnant simply because people will be so uh, naturally well, naturally happy.